Okay, everyone, what's up? Golda here. And we are back for a Big 12 game main slate uh, here on uh, Friday, June 30. We are, what, uh, three full months into the season now, um, coming up on the All-Star break here in a few weeks. And, you know, we actually just yesterday passed the stone midpoint of the entire season. So... Um, let's just continue on and get to a full 12 gamer. So, uh, nice week that we've had here with, what, three big slates so far. Um, might even have another one tomorrow too. So we'll see. Um, usual early day spiel here. We've got uh, projections and ownership loaded to the side already. Um, keep an eye out for some some new updates uh, all throughout the day uh, you can see we've got some uh, projection standard deviations that are popping with a couple of red numbers here uh, some of the models are well they look to have taken their um, July 4th vacations a little bit early so we'll wait till they um, you know hopefully update throughout the day and, and fix some of this this noise that we've got going on here. So keep an eye out for that, of course. Um, now today is, a, I guess, a brief overview here. We got a lot of, like, average arms with a lot of warts in some average, at best, type of spots. Um, you know, we got some bad arms in some bad spots, of course, as well, maybe a bad arm or two in maybe a good spot. I don't know. But for the most part, all of the good arms that we've got are in not good spots outside of one. Uh, and that's McClanahan up here at the top, 11,000, but he's 11,000. Um, everybody else is in a really difficult matchup, I think, or they're just kind of overpriced, at least in my opinion. So, um, Weird day here, and that's kind of fleshing out in the projections so far. Everybody in the mid-range from 7K all the way up to 10K, basically, um, projects within four points of each other, to four, four and a half, give or take. So that usually means that, you know, especially when the numbers are this low, that we could very well see some scoring tonight. Um you know, just one or two arms. I mean, we don't have a single arm even approaching 20 here outside of this McClanahan shenanigans. So, um, might be a decent way to structure our teams tonight and just, you know, you could approach it a couple of different ways, right? You could spread out with all of these arms and just take shots on all of these different guys uh, and then zero in on a couple of offenses. Or you could find an arm or two or you know whatever four or five whatever that you really like and then spread out with a bunch of different offenses and a bunch of different stacks um and i think that uh, i'm not really sure what i'm gonna try doing just yet um i might just like zero in on a, on a few arms and play a bunch of stacks because like i said we got a bunch of spots here that are very attackable and let's just get into the games we'll start with it um Minnesota and Baltimore is one of these games. I think both arms are somewhat attackable here. Now, I love Pablo. I really, really like him. Uh, really like the changes that he made came coming into the season, right? Unfortunately, he's 9,900 here. And over those last several starts, you know, he's been fine for the most part over the, the course of the season, right? The plate discipline numbers here are elite, 30% K rate, 7% walk rate, 71% strike one with great chase. CSW at, at a full 30%. And that's with a 15% nearly swinging strike rate. He's got a four and a half ERA, give or take, with expected metrics about a run lower, 68% strand rate. So if anything, you know, these really good plate discipline numbers could suggest that we might see a little bit of positive regression you know, in the suppression metrics, come to Pablo here. 88 mile an hour average exit velo here is a really good number too. Not giving up homers this year, you know, about a half or three quarters of a homer per outing. And that's fine for the most part. Unfortunately, he's 9,900 in really what's kind of a sticky matchup. Baltimore got Cedric back, right? And they've actually had uh, Ryan O'Hearn in the middle of the lineup who's 
been pretty damn respectable um, since they brought him up. Aaron Hicks has shown a little bit of flash since he got the change of scenery. Ray Gunner's been good. He was very good while Cedric was out at the top of the lineup. Uh, Santander and Rutch, of course, hit from the left side too. So this is a, a sticky team to to get through, and um, you know, with Cedric back at the top of the lineup, it makes them very hard to go after with right-handed pitching in general that doesn't have really outsized whiffs. Now, Pablo does have above-average strikeout stuff to the left side, but he does give up some batting average, right? Gives up a little bit of contact, a little bit of hard, and some fly balls to the lefties. So if that's the one spot that we want to go after Pablo with, I think that Kind of makes sense. Really only in stacks, though. I'm not super jacked about these price tags for the Orioles. 49 for Cedric in um, what I would consider overall a, a down matchup. Uh, it's not great. Same thing with Rutch. Santander still in the mid-4Ks. You could still play him. Ryan O'Hearn at 3,500. That price adjusted is probably the best. I mean, Gunner at 47. You know, yeah, dual eligibility, and, he, and he's Gunner. He's very high upside, but this is kind of an expensive price tag for him. So I'm not super jacked about playing Baltimore here necessarily. I really do respect Pablo. And that kind of does have to put him in play. But I think a lot of the upside is kind of priced in to a certain degree. Now, we do expect a little bit of positive regression to come. And he does have just the 212 XBA. He's very, very good against the right side, right? 26% hard contact rate with a 20 percent or 19 percent soft contact that's really strong he's got more ground balls there and he's got a 34 percent k rate to the righties even though he's given up a 163 iso we don't really care about that when he's striking out a third of the right handers he sees so if we go after him it would be just with a lefty here or there like a cedric uh santander ryan or we really just want santander for the most part from the right side his numbers are uh, quite a bit better you can always play Rush because he walks, but that's not really in the tank necessarily for Pablo here either. So it's hard to get really excited about Baltimore stacks, even though it's a pretty high upside uh, offense against most right-handers in baseball. It's a down matchup, and that does have to put Pablo in play. So he is one of these guys I'm just kind of, for the most part, lukewarm on, and it's mostly because of the price tag. I'm uh, If he were... Uh, 9,200, I'd probably be pretty fine getting a good bit of leverage on the field here. He's coming in at, you know, sub 15% right now, which I think makes sense. There's a lot of guys in this range that we can play. So, um, but at 9,900, it, it kind of takes me off a little bit. I, if he does give up, you know, two, three runs or something like that, he's going to have to strike out quite a few guys and run deep into the game. He has that upside, of course, um, but it does make it a little less probable, of course. So overall, mostly kind of lukewarm there on both Baltimore and Pablo. However, on the other side, I, I do want to go after Dean Kramer. 8,100 on the mound for him. He's also seen 14%, give or take. Uh, I don't know. I do not trust Dean Kramer here. His numbers are dreadful, right? He doesn't have anywhere close to the same plate discipline and suppression metrics that Pablo has, right? He's got a 21% strikeout rate, good walk rate for him also, and fine strike one, but he's only got a 24% chase rate with a 10% swing strike rate. ERA is still at four and a half or so, but his XVIP is also right in that same range. Um, so he's not overly impressive here, and what really worries me with Dean Kramer is the barrel rate. Pushing 11% with just a 21% K rate, Higher contact, far higher contact rate. Pablo's at 72% raw contact, and Dean Kramer is 6% higher than that, right? So with an 11% barrel rate, that makes Dean Kramer far more attackable. He's been getting really hit hard, um, or hit really hard, I should say, against lefties, or by lefties this year. 311 average allowed with a 384 WOBA. It's not because of walks, right? 217 ISO with just an 18% K rate. There's an 075 ground ball to fly ball with 39% hard contact and a 26% line drive rate, right? This is a very good spot for a lot of these twins lefties. Even some of their righties over here, they're going to be able to get to baseball in the air a little bit too. 32% hard contact in the buck 75 ISO allowed from 
from Kramer to the right side. The the problem with the Twins is they are awful. Okay, they're one of the worst teams in baseball, and they do have the highest split adjusted strikeout rate of any team on the day at 27 percent. Now we'll get to you know Seattle later. A couple other teams are are pretty high also, but this 27 percent over this kind of sample, 2,400 plate appearances nearly against righties this season is out of control high. This is like the Detroit Tigers territory of the of the last couple of seasons where we just go after them with everybody in baseball because there was so much upside. Now, they do walk a little bit at 9% as a team. That's kind of an elevated figure. 171 ISO, also kind of an elevated figure, but for the most part, it's only uh, about five points above the slate average today. So 33% hard. Also, mostly just average, neutral ground ball to fly ball. few line drives here. That does kind of put me onto some of these twins. And overall, just a cre- average creation offense with a 315 Woba. So I'm not thrilled about playing the twins, but the, these numbers for Dean Kramer are super attackable. And I think we kind of have to go after um, all of these pretty uh, attackable figures. That's it. Especially with the with guys that are well priced, Eddie Julian leading off uh, at 3100. I really like this price tag, and this is a high upside spot for him to get the baseball on the line. Alex Kirilov as well at 2900, first and outfield eligible. That's really attractive. Even some Byron Buxton, who I despise, at 5300. Kramer's only got the 22.5% K rate against the right side. Now Buxton probably still going to strike out, and will probably hurt himself doing so. Um, but this is an upside spot to get the baseball in the air. He is a fly ball hitter, and with just a neutral ground ball to fly ball p- profile here from Dean Kramer, this, it's an okay spot for Byron Buxton. Uh, he's still going to be able to hit the baseball hard, and Kramer does give up that little bit of power. So that puts him in play, and pretty much anybody else too. Like the only guys price-wise that you're they, they maybe going to balk a little bit at are Buxton at 53 and maybe some Carlos Correa at 45. Um, everybody else is, you know, three and a half K or cheaper. So that may, that very well puts the twins in play despite the super high K stuff. Um, is having some Dean Kramer warranted? I don't know anybody in this range. There's a, maybe another guy or two that I'd like to play in this range that we'll get to. Um, so I'm probably not going to go after a bunch of this. I'm probably just going to play the twins again and just like, smash my head into the wall whenever they strike out uh, 12 freaking times in the first three innings again uh, against a very low upside arm. Um, Now, Dean Kramer is kind of similar to like a Kyle Gibson. He throws a lot of garbage, right? And none of it's any good, but he can pop every so often. Um, And this is one of the matchups in which he could pop. So I got to side with the Twins because they're well-priced and I don't trust Dean Kramer. I'd rather just play them. Uh, because there's more collective upside for an offense rather than there is for a pitcher in a good matchup or a bad pitcher in a good matchup. And that's what really I think Dean Kramer is for the most part. So um, he doesn't really impress me, and I'd rather just go after him. And that's kind of where I stand at the moment on this game. Uh, Milwaukee and Pittsburgh, Freddie Peralta, same sort of deal with him here at 9,700. I think he's maybe a little bit expensive. Now, he's going to see more ownership, of course, because he gets the Pirates. Um, however, he just saw them two starts ago, and he was pretty good then. So in scenarios like this, we've talked about this a lot this season, um, I usually side with the offense when a starting pitcher is seeing a team in pretty short order to a previous start against them, right? And Freddie Peralta has really not been all that great. The walks have resurfaced this season. This is up three and four ticks almost. Uh, this year to where it was last year when the control and the strikeout stuff was really elite. He was up to 30% Ks and about 6% walks. And, well, he's down five ticks in the strikeouts and up three or four ticks in the walks. So uh, over the last several outings, they're still kind of plaguing him. He's walking about three batters per, um, and the results are, are really not there. He's having a little bit more trouble getting ahead in counts, and the... At the early part of the season, the curveball and the slider were both offering a a lot of value for him. But really, for the last month, month and a half, um, I mean, going on two months, really, his last super equitable start, it was two starts ago against Pittsburgh when he struck out nine in six innings. 
Before that, he had one start against Baltimore where he struck out nine and five innings, didn't walk anybody. Four really, really down outings in between the good starts that he had against Detroit, Colorado, and that one serviceable outing against the Dodgers in early May. So it's been a little bit, and Freddie's really kind of been struggling. The price tag is up here at uh, it's not quite seasonal highs because we have seen him above 10,000 in a couple of his earlier starts. But at 9,700, this is nothing to sneeze at. He's the, the exact same price he was two starts ago against Pittsburgh. He gave up two runs and wa- did walk three batters in that outing. So I'm going to have to probably leave Freddie on the shelf, certainly at this ownership here. Um, he does have the upside to pick through this lineup. However, the Pirates, are they're going to get Brian Reynolds back tonight uh, by most accounts. And... He's certainly their best hitter, so I don't really want to go after that. Um, He, of course, didn't see Freddy, whatever, 10 days ago, uh, 12 days ago. But everybody else did. So I'm just going to side with the offense here at an elevated ownership figure. And I think what's kind of a fishy price tag, uh, I think the walks are are really starting to plague Freddy again. And I think some of the upside here is really priced in. So uh, despite the Pirates against right-handed pitching um, being just kind of an average offense, below average in creation, but average in strikeout rate, above average in walk rate for an offense, average in power, slightly below average in hard contact, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think it plays into their hands a little bit more having seen Freda, Freddie uh, just two weeks ago. So um, I think that's probably how I'll end up siding and just, there's so many guys in this range that all project basically equally. I don't want to eat a lot of ownership on one necessarily that, that I don't really trust all that much to be quite honest. Um, this 9% barrel rate with a 9% walk rate. It's a little suspicious for me. Do I go, want to go out of my way to target Freddie? Not necessarily. Of course, right? Jack Sawinski and Brian Reynolds. You can play both of these guys from the left side and Henry Davis. You could play him at 2200 in the outfield. He's a fine, cheap filler piece there if you want to do that. They might do something crazy, like a G1 Bay or something at the top of the lineup or near the top. Who knows? But uh, I think this is an okay spot for a couple of these left-handers and even a righty or two like a Kutch or a Henry Davis to kind of get to Freddy a little. Uh, he does give up a 206 ISO despite a very high strikeout rate there. Uh, a little bit of hard contact. So neutral ground ball to fly ball for, for Freddy makes him a little bit attackable with the declining value in the breaking stuff. Changeups really kind of been break even to below par really all season. Same thing with the four seamer. So uh, not, I mean, I don't think all of these underlying metrics here necessarily warrant this price tag. So uh, I'm probably going to come in under that. Osvaldo Bito on the other side for the Pirates, 7,800. I think he might be a little bit overpriced also for this particular matchup. Now, he's had three good starts, or three serviceable starts, I should say. Um, and three pretty good matchups, though, right? Cubs have been struggling over the last little while, right? And he had Miami, who's kind of a, a break-even offense, too, certainly before they got Jazz Chisholm back. Um, and he has been fine, right? Strikeout stuff has been pretty impressive so far. Six, seven, and five Ks in four innings, six innings, and five and two thirds against the Cubs twice, and then Miami in his last start. But for the most part, upside a little bit capped here because, um, you know, unlikely to run deeper than six innings. However, this is, you know, Milwaukee, so that could play into his hands a little bit more. Um, Upside a little bit capped, though, because. He's still giving up some production, right? He'll give up two to three runs, and the the strikeout stuff isn't all too impressive. Um, however, similar to the Twins, you know, Milwaukee is bad as well, right? Twenty five percent. This is the third highest, uh, I believe, it's the third highest split adjusted strikeout rate. Yes, it is on the day. Eighty eight WRC plus for Milwaukee. 302 WOBA, thirty two percent high. Everything else is average here for them as well. 230 batting average. They'll walk a little bit, but like, I mean, that doesn't really matter if you're striking out this much and you can't create steal bases or anything like that. Nobody for them steals bases. Um, and since Yelich tweaked his back earlier in the season, he was stealing, but since he did that, he's not running anymore. So um, 
really not a lot of creation coming from the Brewers over here. So I think that has to put Beto in play. And he's at a more playable price tag than any of the guys that we've talked about before. I certainly would prefer Beto to Dean Kramer um, at 300 cheaper. But uh, it, and what I view is mostly a similar matchup, I think. So I think that has to put him in play. I do think he's a little bit pricey. Um, but Xing him out of the pools is... I don't think that's totally warranted. He could very well pop for 20 or 22 here tonight. Um, but once again, I think his upside is probably capped somewhere in that range. If you want to go after him, uh, it would my favorite would just have to be Yelich by default at 4,400. Uh, I'm not even super attracted to Rowdy, even though he's 3,700. It's a very playable price tag for him. Jesse Winker stinks. Uh, I'm just going to go elsewhere. Willie Adamas is fine at 42. He hits righties just fine. And, and same thing with Willie Contreras. He's got down numbers against righties, definitely. Um, and he might strike out here a little bit. You know, we got a short sample, so we can't take too much out of the, the whiff stuff and the suppression metrics necessarily just yet. Um, is Beto probably due for a real stinker? Yeah, maybe, but is this the offense to really make that happen? Eh, probably not in most scenarios. Now, they're very well-priced, and that has to put them in play, but uh, I don't know. They're, they're pretty... St- pretty much struggling um i think price adjusted outside of yelich it would probably be bryce terang second in shortstop eligibility they did just call him back up having to send luis urias back down who hasn't made contact in in two months it seems like uh he's three thousand, so i like that a little bit um and you can play joey weimer down at the bottom he's got some pop and and play perkins as well these guys are cheap filler pieces i think that's okay if you want to go after Beto a little bit, but this is a big ballpark. I'm not super jacked about that. Mostly a write-off game for me. I'll have some Freddy, I think. Um, you know, but almost definitely going to come in owner, under that ownership figure. All right, let's move on. Boston and Toronto. James Paxton on the mound, 10-3. I think he's pretty overpriced, to be quite honest. Now, of the guys up here, I think this is a really shrewd tournament play to get on to some James Paxton. Uh, I think he's overpriced. Let's start there, right? But he's 4% owned. That's attractive. He's got a 32% strikeout rate this year in, in eight starts. That's very attractive. What's not attractive is the 41-42% hard contact to the right side and 070 ground ball to fly ball with a 23% line drive rate. Right, That is not encouraging at all here. He's got a 10.5% barrel rate to right-handers this season, 90-mile-an-hour average exit velo. So good walk rate. That's That's... Good, you know, so I don't really want to go out of my way to stack against him for the most part because Toronto is uh, well below average, I would say. This, this creation metric is kind of surprisingly high. They've been terrible against left handed pitching really all year. They don't see a lot of left handers, right? Just 600 PAs. We're halfway through the season against lefties. It's because everybody in their lineup, all their good hitters anyway, uh, hit from the right side. So opposing teams just throw right handers against them, which probably isn't the best idea. So that's why I think Paxton is in play here. He's a well above average lefty in terms of swing and miss. We're not worried about depressed numbers against lefties. Number one, it's a super short sample. Number two, they don't have any lefties. Um, the guys that they do have aren't any good, and they, they would strike out a crap load in this matchup against Paxton. So I'm not concerned about that. What I'm really just, you know, sort of... Uh, Worried with Paxton, I suppose. Uh, easy for me to spit out. Um, is the hard contact and and the the little pop that he does give up. 165 ISO. It's not really in batting average, though. So I'm okay playing a little bit of Paxton at a an inflated price tag and a down strikeout matchup. Let's not get this confused. They're still not going to strike out a lot. Uh, but this is a huge delta, 19% to 35%. Right There's a good bit of leeway for Paxton to operate within that range and still achieve a 23 25% strikeout rate against these right-handers that he's going to see tonight. So um, I think that puts him in play a little bit, and it's certainly the ownership that's mostly attracting me here. But, I mean, a 131 ISO, you can't really ignore this for Toronto. All of these right-handed hitters should be a lot better against lefties, but they're really not. They do still hit for a little bit of average, but once again, Paxton only giving up so far this year a 180 batting average against to the right side. Um, Not going to walk a lot of guys, and for the most part, he's going to stay under control. So uh, I do like him a little bit in tournaments. Because of the upside, um, but you can play a couple Blue Jays here on the other side too. 
I mean, price adjusted, I guess. It's got to be like Alejandro Kirk, considering the high ground ball rate for him. Um, you know, 52 for Vladdy is, is fine. The favorites certainly just have to be Springer, Bovichette, Vladdy. Um, I don't want to play pretty much anybody else. So Whit Merrifield stinks. Uh, he might be able to make a little bit of hard contact. He's one of the guys that does create for them. He'll steal some bases. Um, and Bichette's got a little bit of speed, right? But, uh, I mean, for the most part, I don't want, I want to stay off of Matt Chapman. He's a very high fly ball hitter. I mean, if he gives up contact, Paxton, ball's probably going to go over the wall no matter who it's against. So, you know, there's that. If you want to stack Toronto, like, I, I, I guess, go ahead. But uh, they're pretty underwhelming against left-handed pitching overall. So uh, I, I think I got to side with Paxton here rather than pay the normal price tags for Toronto in what I think is a down matchup for them. So uh, that's kind of where I stand so far right now. I mean, you don't really have to get crazy with the Paxton. You can play 10% here and get 2.5x leverage on the field. I think that's plenty. Uh, Jose Barrios on the mound for the Blue Jays, 9,500. I think he's also kind of overpriced here. Um, You know, we're probably going to say this a lot, and it's also a down matchup, right? This is Boston. Now, Josie's strikeout stuff this season, really down. It's okay to the lefties here at about an average clip, but to the right-handers, it's way, way down. Um, And this is really surprising because the two-seamer sinker has always actually given him a good bit of swing and miss to the right side. Now, good thing for Josie this year is he's seemingly totally solved the homer problem and the hard contact problem to both sides of the play, he was getting picked apart something terrible last season, and he's really figured it out. So that's super encouraging to see him normalize. Still doesn't have a very good change, so he still gives up a little bit of pop to the lefties and some average, right? 280 with a 343 Woba and a 165 ISO. But the hard contact is totally gone, and anything that he's giving up is mostly on the ground now, right? Buck 50, ground ball to fly ball. Does have a 25% line drive rate. So that does put a couple of these lefties in play for Boston, notably a Rafi Devers at a very attractive price tag. 51 for him is super intriguing. I like that a decent bit. Jared Duran at 33. I think this is okay also. 43 for Verdugo is not the greatest. Um, Not a a lot of raw upside for him, but he's okay in stacks, I think, as is Yoshida at 48. Not my favorite price tag. Casas is fine batted ball-wise because he's a fly ball hitter. And Josie's going to be able to keep it on the ground for the most part. That should turn into some line drives for Casas a little bit. So I think some of these line drive hitters that uh, with low strikeout rates, notably Devers, Yoshida, and a little bit of Alex Verdugo, I think that plays into them their, and their strengths a little bit. Um, overall, not super thrilled because it, it's going to be kind of hard for Boston, I think, to pick put together a, a lot of real... Uh, sustained offense because Josie's still very good against right-handers, right? 113 ISO allow with a 209 batting average against. His expected batted ball metrics are a little bit higher than his realized numbers, so you could see a little bit of negative regression come in that respect. 360 ERA with expecteds, you know, in roughly the same range at about 404 and a half, give or take. For the most part, I think everything is right in line for Josie with where it should be and I'm really attracted to the decreased hard contact figures and the increase in in um, ground ball to fly ball ratio so for the most part don't want to necessarily stack Boston but some short pieces here where they're well priced Jaron Duran is well priced even though he's probably going to strike out here a little bit uh, Devers definitely and Tristan Casas for sure um, and you can mix in the other guys you know if you want to play right it'd be like a Connor Wong or something from behind the plate at 2800 he's at a playable price tag even a Justin Turner he doesn't strike out a lot but you got to play him at sole first base on a 12 game slate and that kind of stinks so overall um I guess my favorite in this game would probably be Paxton because I don't really want to play a lot of the Blue Jays um yeah it, I mean it, it has to be Devers uh above Paxton but uh, just pieces I think here for me okay let's move on San Francisco and the Mets uh, I think I want to play the Giants again even though they were just totally disastrous against Chris Bassey yesterday. Um, Alex Cobb on the mound for them, 8,600. I think in the mid-range, he's got to be in play here. Now, he does have a drastic strikeout split, which is really what we've got to be concerned with here. And I think that at 8,600, that um, tempers my enthusiasm a little bit. I do really like the ground ball stuff, of course. 
Uh, and batted ball wise, the Mets they just don't hit the baseball in the air outside of a couple of guys. Um, you know, from the left side it'd be Frankie Lindor, from the right side it'd be Pete Alonso, of course. Everybody else is like a neutral or a ground ball hitter, and that really plays into Alex Cobb batted ball wise. So that's what attracts me to him today. It's not really power that he gives up, so I'm not necessarily worried about that. But to the left-handers, just a 13.5% K rate. And this is a huge, huge split. We're talking 18% nearly um, in delta to the strikeout rate to the right side, which is 31%. So these other guys from the Mets from the right side, right, Starling Marte, Tommy Pham, outside of Pete Alonso, who only has a 20% K rate, give or take, uh, these guys are probably going to strike out a little bit. Frankie Alvarez, too. But they're going to be pretty balanced, as they always are. So I'm lukewarm on Alex Cobb. I really like the ownership. Um, and the high ground ball rate does put him in play for me. For the most part, the plate discipline, pretty damn good, right? Very efficient early in the count. 68% strike one, 31% chase. 28% CSW, it's pretty strong. Um 3-0 ERA, like he's a, he's a good arm anymore. He's got a really damn good pitch here in the split that he relies on quite heavily. So um, sinker split curveball combination here going after a very weak offense. It's a unique arsenal, and I think that plays into Alex Cobb's strengths a little bit more than the Mets here. If I had to choose anybody, it'd be like a Brandon Nimmo. Probably, I mean, nobody from the right side uh, outside of Pete Alonzo. You can always play him at 5,000. That's fine. But it'd be Brandon Nimmo, Frankie Lindor from the left side. And outside of that, I'm not super attracted to anybody else. Um, so maybe just a three-man of the Mets if I get there at all. But this game's still at City Field, and I don't want to go after a super high ground ball pitcher with a bad offense. Um, they're overall just break even against right-handed pitching this year. Despite a, a low strikeout rate, high contact rate, they just don't do anything else. So um, I'm okay playing Alex Cobb at 86 in the mid-range if you land on that. I think that's fine. Cookie on the other side, 6,000 for him. No thanks. Uh, I don't want to deal with this. Uh, he's been terrible all season. He's had a start here or there where he's popped. Um, you know, But uh, if you want to consider popped 18, 20 points, I mean, that's it. Like He's done it twice this year. And every other outing has been 10 points or less. So no thanks. I, I can't do it with Cookie. Uh, I think he's fully busted here. He's got a, what, 4.5% K minus walk rate anymore? It, like, this does not suggest uh, any future success for him. So 55% strike one. You can go after him with both righties and lefties. This season, it's been mostly right handers that have gotten to him. So I'm okay playing full stacks of the Giants here today, whereas yesterday it was mostly short stacks, um, at least in my preference. Today here in the platoon, I mean, you could always play the lefties, right? You could play Lamont Wade, doesn't strike out a lot. He's got a, a pretty decent hit tool against right-handers. Same thing with Jock and Patty Bailey, Blake Sabal. You could play these guys as well. But from the right side, I think Tyro is very much in play here at 52, as is J.D. Davis at 42. So full stacks for me uh, are certainly in play for the Giants. I want to go after this. They're well down the board in ownership so far and in value because they're really not very good. But Cookie is not going to throw it past them, and that's really how you go after the Giants. You need guys that can that can get some swing and miss and induce swing and miss like Chris Bassett actually can a little bit. Um, Cookie just can't do that anymore. 25% strikeout rate, that's how you have to go after the Giants. And when you can't throw it past them, they're going to make contact and, and they're going to be able to realize this ISO and this hard contact number. And the walk rate up there for them, Cookie's got a 10.5% walk rate too. So I think this is a very intriguing tournament stack here for the Giants, uh, despite this being at City Field. Um, you know, these guys are going to hit the ball over the wall. And when they do, they can win tournaments. So uh, I'm really attracted to the Giants here. Okay, Miami and Atlanta. Brian Hoeing on the mound for the Marlins. Um, he gets Atlanta, so no thanks. I don't think you need to get all the way down here. There's one other guy you might be able to consider. Uh, we'll get to him a little bit later. Um, but Brian Hoeing's not him, so no thanks against Atlanta. They are always one of the top stacks if you can finagle the price tags. It's, uh, it's pretty difficult to make all of it happen, so you have to play some of the guys down at the bottom of the lineup, but they're not really all that cheap either. Eddie Rosario's 4,200 now. Marcelo Soon is 4,500. Orlando Arcia is 44, and Michael Harris is 46. So 
like, where are you going to save money with Atlanta stacks here if you want to play Acuna at 66, Ozzy Albies at 56, Austin Riley, I think price adjust has probably got to be the best play here, 5,500. Sean Murphy maybe at 53, but Matt Olson is 64. I mean, this is not easy to get to Brave Stacks. If you can make this happen, like, yeah, I'm fully on board with it. Because Brian Holmes is going to give up pop to the right-hander. 256 average allowed is fine. 320 Woba is fine. Buck 71 ISO, that's attackable, though, with a 21% strikeout rate. These guys are going to be able to get the baseball on a, on a line and in the air here a little bit. Notably Acuna, Austin Riley, Sean Murphy uh, from the right side. Marcel Asuna as well. He didn't strike out a lot. Not great against um, against right-handers necessarily, but you know he, he makes contact. He's been seeing the baseball better. From the left side, Ozzy Albee's been terrible all season, so it's really hard to convince me that uh, he's all that great at 5,600. Matt Olson, sure, he's 64, though. So this is very hard to get to the Braves, but if you can make it happen, uh, I'm okay with this because... Um, Brian Hoeing's really not all that impressive, right? Just kind of an average arm at a very bad spot. Now, he does stay off of the barrel here, at least in his abbreviated starts and, you know, mostly bullpen outings this year. 82% strand rate, though, is kind of aggressive, even considering that he's coming out of the bullpen. I mean, that's very attractive, having come out of the bullpen. But as a starter, that's going to be far lower, of course. Um, and he's got a 2.5 ERA with an, an XFIP two runs higher than that. So if there were regression coming to him in the terms of the strand rate and the suppression, it's probably likely to, to come in Atlanta against one of the best offenses in baseball. Um, so I'm fine getting to them if you can make it happen. Problem is you got to punt on the mound and you got to probably punt your other stack too to get to full stacks of the Braves. So that's pretty difficult to make happen. Um, Mike Soroka is probably going to get called up today. He That's where he is in his rehab. Um, or excuse me, is um, in the minor league rotation. He, they sent him down early in the season because he just was pitching to way too much contact. As we can see here in the short sample, he made two starts. He got blasted, right? He had a 10% strikeout rate with a 12.5% walk rate and 81% contact. Wasn't, th wasn't throwing it past anybody. Now, historically, he's never really been a high strikeout arm. Um that might be improving a little bit. He did strike out like nine in his last outing or something uh, in the minors. And this is an okay matchup. Uh, however, having just gotten Jazz Chisholm back, like I'm not doing it with Soroka. I do like the price tag at 7,100. Um, I think he's got a little bit of suppression upside in him. But, I mean, does he really? They just got Jazzy, and like, now they've got Luis Arise, Jorge Soler, Brian De La Cruz is not a slouch up at the top. Jazz Chisholm, Garrett Cooper's actually been hitting a, for a little bit of power. Gene Segura didn't strike out. You know, like, this is a... Jesus Sanchez has some pop from the left side of the plate. This is a pretty difficult lineup to go after. And look at this. They're 14 games above 500. Like, are you kidding me? Uh, this is an okay baseball team over here. They pitch well. Brian Hoeing, you know, notwithstanding. And they just got one of their best hitters back. Um, but it's certainly their best power hitter from the left side of the plate. I want to get to some jazzy today in a small ballpark. It's hot in Atlanta. You got to keep an eye out for pop-up storms as always down there. But um, can you stomach 4,900 Luis Arise on a 14 game? I mean, they're a 12 game slate. Sure, I guess. You know, he needs 15 points or whatever to, to really make that okay. And it's, I mean, it's it's in the tank for him. Um, you know. I'll, I'll, a lot more regularly than a lot of other guys. Georgie Soler, I think, is fine here at 4,800 against a guy that's not generally going to throw it past him. Um, and you can certainly play Jazzy and Brian De La Cruz. So uh, I like playing uh, a decent bit of the Marlins here. I think they're an intriguing off-the-board stack. If you want to get to, you know, just play the weather in this game, but you can't make the price tags happen for the Braves, just play the Marlins on the other side. I think they're a very viable five-man stack. Really, one through five is playable. You could play Jesus Sanchez down at the bottom. Um, if you mix in a Joey Wendell or something, he's a contact piece at 2,500 at shortstop. That's all right, too, as a wraparound or something. Uh, or Nick Fortes, if it's him. Jacob Stallings, you know, maybe not so much, but he's 2,100. You know, So you could make worse plays than playing the Marlins here. It's a pretty okay baseball team, kind of surprisingly. So uh, I like offense mostly here. And, you know, Soroka's in play at 71, but not overly thrilled uh, about going after the Marlins. 
Uh, okay, Houston, Texas, same sort of deal here. I'm not playing Ronel Blanco against Texas. There's no chance that happens. Um, he's got a 12% walk rate and a 12% barrel rate. So immediately I throw that out the window. 35% um, hard contact rate nearly to the right side, 34% in aggregate. So it's not all that much lower to the lefties. You know, we have a shortish sample here. You know, but we have 35 innings. He's seen 100. 50 hitters this year, a lot of appearances out of the bullpen, which have, you know, it may perhaps inflated his, his numbers in, you know, sort of, uh, manufactured situation, so to speak, but he's still giving up pop, man. 185 ISO to lefties, 213 ISO to the righties with a 208 X ISO, 351 X Woba and a 251 XBA. These are attackable figures here with hard contact. The homers per nine number is probably a little bit noisy still in the short sample, but fly balls, right? 070 ground ball to fly ball to both sides. And I think that's very much attackable if he's going to get on the barrel. Uh, Four-seamer slider, that's the fly, fly ball lean there. And, I mean, Texas has a couple of pretty damn good hitters from the right side. Marcus Semien and Adelis Garcia, Josh Young as well. Now, we want to stay away from some guys that are going to strike out. That would be Josh Young. 4700 price tag, probably not my favorite price-adjusted third base play on the day. But uh, you can certainly play him in stacks. It's totally fine. Corey Seager should be back today. Got a day off yesterday. They watered down the lineup a little bit on getaway day yesterday. Um, so I think they should have their number ones going here, the Rangers. And you should see Semi and Seager, Nate Lowe at 4400 It's still a very playable price tag there. Garcia, Young, Jonah Heim should be back, who also got a day off yesterday. Um We'll see what they want to do in the outfield. They do some platoon shenanigans down at the bottom. So they might platoon Zeke Duran and play like a Robbie Grossman or a Travis Jankowski or something from the left side. But he's in he's in play against uh, Renault Blanco here because he still gives up pop to the right-handers too. So that's all right um, if he's in there. You can play Leoti, sure. So I like Texas, once again, as I, as I like every, you know, them every day. Um, and they score... 26 runs a game when they play at home. So, yeah, sign me up for the Rangers. No Ronel Blanco. Uh, I just don't play guys, even with some elevated strikeout stuff. Like, did this walk and barrel figure? No, thank you. Um, I think Texas is a very intriguing tournament stack. You know, whale down the board in value because they're so expensive. But, um, you know, that, that keeps their ownership down and really like playing them when they're totally unowned. John Gray on the mound for them. I 9,300, uh, okay. I'd like him if he were a little bit cheaper here. This matchup isn't the best necessarily. His strikeout stuff to the right side of the plate is like suspiciously low. You know, it's always kind of been lower to the lefties, but it's like, you know, suspiciously low to the right-handers at 21%. He's always got a, always had a really good slider, I should say. And he's just not getting whiffs with it. So when he loses four seam command, you see outings like you saw, uh, what, two starts ago against Toronto where he just gets bludgeoned, gives up, what, uh, six runs in um, two and a third innings or something like that. And, uh, yeah, it was two and a third, gave up six runs, struck out just two against Toronto. Didn't last long enough to realize any upside. He walked batters, right? When he starts spraying this four-seamer, the control just goes totally out the window. And despite having a very high strike one rate, if he starts walking, he'll do this occasionally where he just throws it to the freaking backstop, starts spiking the slider, and then he's just got nothing. And anything he throws over the middle of the plate is likely to go over the wall. Um, however, in aggregate, the number is pretty good. He went on a really strong six game stretch there, but he had some kind of suspiciously good matchups. Seattle twice. He had. Uh, Baltimore in there against righties. They're a little bit more attackable there. He had Oakland once. He had Colorado away from Coors Field, right? And he had St. Louis, who is not a very good offense. So some good matchups there that probably contributed to his really strong run. Then he goes on the, or skips a start with a blister, comes back and gets blasted by Toronto. Also wasn't that impressive in his last outing against the Yankees. Struck out just four, only gave up one run. So that's nice but did still walk two in five innings. So we might see some up and down shenanigans here with John Gray. And at 9,300, I, like I said, I like him a little bit cheaper if I'm going to try and get leverage on the field. I think coming in at 15 to 20% of him is okay. There's plenty of other guys you could play. You don't have to eat this necessarily. Um, 
in what's you know not all that attractive a matchup. He's he's good against righties still, right? 098 ISO allowed with a 203 batting average allowed, right? 157 X ISO, 253 XBA, and a 320 X Woba. These are all really good numbers. If you want to go after him, it's mostly with left-handers. He gives up more fly balls there, 172 ISO, and he's got the similar 22% strikeout rate. Hard contact, you'd like it to be a little bit more elevated to get super jacked about full stacking against him. So, yeah, just give me Kyle Tucker again, 5,100. That's fine. Um... Everybody else, though, like they don't really have any other lefties. So I'm okay playing John Gray here because he suppresses very well against right-handers. I'm worried about strikeout upside necessarily at this particular price tag, but I think it put, has to put him in play for 22 to 25 points because he's likely to get some run support uh, with Texas getting Renel Blanco on the other side, right? It's just an average creation offense over here against righties when they're missing um, – Gordon Alvarez still, and Michael Brantley, who is still out. So give me mostly just Texas and some John Gray here um, and some Kyle Tucker where I can make it fit. But uh, everybody else from the Astros, I'm not super interested in at the moment. Uh, okay, let's move on. Dodgers and the Royals. Bobby Miller on the mound. This is the guy in the 9K range that I prefer to play. 8,900. Now, I know the strikeout stuff, at least – to the right side has been kind of depressed here. I, I think he's got more in the tank. I think we're going to see this number tick up. He's got a pretty okay breaking arsenal, as a matter of fact, and he's got a damn good changeup. Now, he does just throw the two-seamer, which is not the whiff pitch, but he stays down in the strike zone. He's kind of similar to a Dustin May, and he throws a really, really hard sinker. It just doesn't translate to a lot of whiffs because it's not a, a strikeout pitch necessarily. Um, but he's got... You know, a pitcher, even two pitches more than Dustin May, you know, that he can go to work with. And he still has elite velocity. In this particular matchup against the Royals, I, I would like to go after them. Once again, I mean, they're, what, 35 games under 500? Are you serious? Um, we saw what Shane Bieber did to them yesterday. Any respectable arm, even with below average strikeout stuff anymore, uh, but like Bieber still struck out nine, I think. Uh, in six innings or whatever it was. And I think Bobby Miller's got something similar, at least that kind of upside in the tank here. Elite strike one, 67% is really strong, really good chase, and that's the the playable breaking arsenal coming into play here at 31%. 24% CSW, we need this to, to tick up quite a bit. Um, you know, to get super thrilled about playing him in the future at an elevated 8,900 price tag, but this is a really good matchup, and we still got very short sample uh, noise to let flesh out just yet it, it, for a young arm here. But uh, I'm really attracted to the velocity and mostly the matchup. Royals are uh, garbage. ADWRC plus, 25% K rate, 228 batting average allowed, one of the lowest numbers on the day, sub-150 ISO, 34% hard, okay, but I don't really care when you're striking out this much and you don't create. So, um, yeah, give me some Bobby Miller. I'm okay getting some leverage on the field here. I'd rather come in under to some of the guys that we talked about and get over on Bobby Miller. I think that's probably how I'm going to play it tonight. Um, and, of course, we can play the Dodgers, too. They get Alec Marsh. He's mostly a double-A arm. Now, he's got a little bit of experience at triple-A, but this is going to be his major league debut. He's only got five total starts there, I believe, in the last two seasons at triple-A. And it was... Um, Let's see, one start, no, excuse me, two starts in 2022, and then three starts this year. So he's mostly a double-A arm. He does have a little bit of whiff stuff here. And, you know, in the upper minors, he's displaying, you know, roughly a 25% strikeout rate, 26%, give or take. He's got some swinging strikes in him, about a 15% swinging strike rate. That's super attractive. So there's upside there. Um, and he's 4,000. However, this is the Dodgers, and this is a double-A arm. I don't really care. He's got some walk problems. As with any young arm, they don't make it to the big leagues all that quickly if they've got walk issues. And he certainly does. Um, in the upper minors, and mostly double-A, he's pushing an 11% walk rate. So um, I don't really want to be screwing around with that against the Dodgers. This is you know, the most patient team in baseball, they don't beat themselves. They don't go out of the strike zone. And we saw what, you know, against a bad pitching staff, that can translate into, they just scored a crap load of runs. Um, yeah, it's a Coors Field, but you know, they still walk a lot, right? You have to 
still make contact with the baseball and put yourself in those kinds of positions to score a lot of runs. And they do this better than anybody, and they still do it. Um, you know, despite having lost, you know, what Trey Turner and and some other guys. So, uh, yeah, I want to play the Dodgers once again. It's also a price problem with them. You know, they're they're going to be the most popular team again, but it's not like they're at Coors Field. You're not going to see 20% ownership on them necessarily. Maybe a guy here or there. Price adjusted. Oh yeah, yeah. It's probably got to be one of the cheaper outfielders, David Peralta, Jason Hayward. I think. Um, Freddie Freeman. Yeah, I'm. Sure, let's play him at 6,000. I'm okay with that. Mookie at 61, also still okay with this. 58 for Will Smith is a little stiff for a catcher. Uh, and Max Muncy, I think, is dreadful at 5,000. Uh, he's playable um, in Dodger stacks just because he has power. And it's a, it's a tournament play. But um, this is most certainly not a cash third base play. He hits 180 and strikes out a crap load. So, um yeah, I think Alec Marsh at 4000 you know, the price tag would put him in play. And he is a starter. He's fully stretched out. If you wanted to, like, take some super deep tournament shots, get some leverage on the field, um, you know, and save a lot of freaking money, like, he's got upside for 12, 15 points. And 15 points out of a $4,000 arm, you know, that could get you there in tournaments if you nail everything else. You know, you could stack Atlanta, for example, um, and get to another cheaper arm or something like that. Stack the Angels with Trout and Otani, whatever. That, yeah, that's not totally out of play, but uh, I'm probably just going to leave it on the shelf. This is a double-A arm against uh, what I would consider you know, definitely a, a top two offense in baseball, um, top three for sure. Um, so I don't really want to deal with this. I don't think you're going to need to get all the way down here. I think you could make some pivots in the mid-range on the mound, where you won't require that. And there's still 24 different offenses that you can play here. Um, Royals, probably not one of them for me. I don't want to go after Bobby Miller. I think he is very respectable, and their offense stinks, so uh, no thanks. Okay, let's move on. Detroit and Colorado, you can play both the offenses here. I don't think you could play either of the arms. Now, Lorenzen would be the only guy that you could consider in, like, 500 max tournaments, if, if those existed. Um... 6400 for him puts him in play, price tag considered alone, right? Uh, outside of that, I really don't think we could do it here at Coors Field. 81% contact rate with a 9.5%, 10% barrel rate. That's a bit too aggressive for me at Coors Field. Even against Rockies, this is a bad offense, but they are getting... They did just get C.J. Krohn back. Um, they are getting Chris Bryant back tonight as well. He will be activated tonight. He's 4700 Don't really want to go out of my way to play it necessarily. Um, but this lineup is healthy now, and they do have Bryant, McMahon, Diaz, Crone it back in there. And these are their their guys that can hit the baseball out. Now, Nolan Jones has a little bit of pop. You could play him. Jury Profar, not so much. Probably still going to lead him off, unfortunately. And I think our days of seeing Zeke Tovar up at the top of the lineup may uh, be behind us, unfortunately. Uh, Bud Black still insists on playing Jerry Profar at the top for some stupid reason. Uh, he's got no production, and he rarely just gets on base anymore. Um, there's no upside hitting 250, even at Coors Field. Uh, I wish they'd just give Zeke Tobar the run, but, you know, who am I to, to question lineup decisions, whatever. Um, so they're in play because Lorenzen pitches to so much contact here, right? It's mostly left-handers that I'd like to go after him with generally, because it gives up more power and more hard contact there and more fly balls, right? The right-handers, you need line drive and fly ball hitters. That's mostly C.J. Crone. He's at a playable 4,600. Elias Diaz and Chris Bryant, though, not necessarily fly ball hitters. They've got, you know, fly balls in them, and they can lift the baseball a little bit, but I don't want to go out of my way to be targeting that necessarily. Um, Lorenzen's still going to be able to stay down in the strike zone a little bit here with his slider changeup. You know, the four seamer and the two seamer should help him keep you know, should keep him down a little bit as well. But for the most part, you know that four seamer slider is a fly ball lean. So that's where you see the fly balls come to the left side of the plate. Um, so I price tag would put him in play. Ownership would put him in play. But he's at Coors Field and he just pitches to um, too much contact for me. I'd rather just get to a piece here or there of the Rockies. Unfortunately, they're just kind of expensive. I'm lukewarm on the price tags. Um, you know, Chris at 47 is not great. 48 for Ryan McMahon, not great when he's cold. 
as he is right now. 44 for Diaz is fine, and CJ Crone at 46 is fine. Same thing with Nolan Jones and Zeke Tovar. He's still the best price-adjusted play, I think, at 3,800, but he might be in the seven hole. So, um, yeah, kind of meant for the Rockies here tonight, even though they do get Detroit. They always pop in value, and they're cheap enough to mix in two other stacks here. But I, I think that's how I would probably approach it tonight. Um, just filler pieces rather than full stacks of the Rockies. You can mix in some, of course, because if they put up a 12 spot or something, uh, you know, you're dead in the water if you don't have full stacks. But that's kind of how I'd like to approach it. Uh, Austin Gomber is an instant no. 15% strikeout rate, 8% walk rate, 11% barrel rate. Absolutely not. Um, Detroit Tigers against lefties, 98 WRC plus now. This was 90 about four days ago. 10% walk rate for them, 23% strikeout rate. That's average. 235 batting average, not impressive, but a 167 ISO, kind of sneaky, 37% hard contact. Austin Gomber against right-handers, 39% hard contact. And in the 75 hitters he's seen from the left side of the plate, 44% hard contact. Not a chance I go anywhere near Gomber. He just doesn't have anything. He's not impressive. Um, and I think this is how I'd like to play the Tigers as well. The bottom half of their lineup stinks, and even a Coors Field doesn't have really any upside. Uh, Javi Baez at 4900 is an egregiously high price tag. That's out of control terrible. Um, I'm not going to be playing that. I'll let everybody else do it. And if it burns me, it burns me. Uh, so it's just the top three and maybe like an Eric Haas or Jake Rogers, whoever's behind the plate. Veerling Torque and, and Andy Abanez. I don't want to play Scope. I don't want to play Miggy Cabrera. Uh, maybe a Zach Short, cheap, dual eligible middle infield piece um, as a wraparound or something if I get to full stacks. But mostly short pieces here for me. I think I'd rather use them as fillers because they're a bad offense. Still, they're only average. It, it, of course, Coors Field's going to play up their numbers. Um, and Austin Gomber's certainly going to play up their numbers. So you can get to full stacks. It's not uh, out of out of the question by any means, but uh, I think my favorites are just pieces of Veerling, Torque, and Ibanez, or, you know, Eric Oss or Jake Rogers, something like that. Uh, okay, let's move on to the Yankees and St. Louis. Now, both offenses, I think, are in play here. Neither pitcher really is for me. Luis Severino, like, I think he's just broken. What are we doing here? 20% strikeout rate, 9% walk rate for him with a 12% barrel rate also. Uh, so I don't want to play him against the Cardinals, even though this offense is bad. They're 14 games under 500. And they're expensive. I don't really want to stack them necessarily. I'd probably prefer to just to get to some pieces. Like Brandon Donovan doesn't have a lot of upside. This is an okay spot for him because Seve's giving up some power. 172 ISO to the left side, 38% hard contact and some fly balls. That's fine. Nolan Arenado from the right side, price adjusted. I think that's the best play at 5,300. He will get the baseball in the air here. And I think that's fine. He's not, he doesn't strike out a lot, right? 33% hard and a 238 R, I, excuse me, 238 ISO allowed to the right handos, right handers, um, getting a little tongue tied here for Severino this year. So wait, with 2.3 homers per nine, maybe this is, I mean, this is definitely noisy in the homers per nine numbers, you know, but he's given up eight homers and seven starts and that's not good. No matter how you slice it, 5-0 XFIP this season, uh, I'm not going near this, um, even if, you know, the Cardinals offense, as we alluded to earlier, is bad. But you really want to play 5,700 Paul Goldschmidt? I mean, that's kind of stiff on a 12-game slate. Um, so give me Arenado and, and some Lars at 4,000. I think that's fine. Donovan, sure. Uh, Contreras behind the plate, 42. That's all right. Price adjusted from the right side. Outside of Arenado, it's Jordan Walker at 32, but they've shoved Nolan Gorman down to the seven hole now since he's really cooled off a little bit. Um, you know, 4,600, eh, kind of gross. So not super thrilled about Cardinal stacks, even though I do like going after Severino. I think he's fully busted here. He's got no value on any one of the pitches. Um, I don't want to deal with any of this. So give me some Cardinals where I can make it happen. Arenado, Lars, and... Maybe a Jordan Walker, kind of a little, little three-man there. I think that's playable. Same thing with Matt Libertor on the other side. I don't think this is playable either. 6,200 for him, 16% K rate, 11% walk rate nearly. 5.3% K minus walk rate is dreadful. 54% strike one, 23% chase rate, no thanks. 22% CSW, we're not de dealing with this. 570 XFIP for him. 41% hard contact in a, in 100 hitters that he's seen this season. 314 average allowed to the righties. 388 Woba with a 13% walk rate. 
neutral ground ball to fly ball, 24% line drives, etc., etc. It's all bad. Uh, give me the Yankees once again, and we've talked about their offense starting to heat up a little bit. They've had good matchups against, good, you know, like Oakland pitching or whatever. This is another really good matchup. So they're very well priced, and they're going to see some ownership right in line with Colorado and Detroit here today. But I think they're it, they should be a top stack, even though the offense is pretty bad. Um, this is a very high upside spot for them, and they're very well priced. DJ, they've been leading off. They'll probably do that again tonight. Thirty-one hundred for him. That's fine. Five thousand for Glaber. I like forty-five for Stanton. I wouldn't say I like because he sucks, but it's okay. He's playable. Thirty-six for Bader and thirty-three for Donaldson are very attractive price tags for sure. Uh, do you want to play an IKF? He's actually playable. I think in this particular matchup tonight, twenty-one hundred in the outfield. Same thing with Volpe at thirty-two and Higgs or Trevino behind the plate. Whoever they probably be Higgs since it was Trevino yesterday. But very playable price tags, top to bottom for for all of these guys. Um, Yankees are very much in play, as are some of the Cardinals. Uh, okay, let's move on to Arizona and the Angels. Uh, Tommy Henry on the mound, uh, also another arm that I'm not interested in. 6600 it's an attractive price tag, I think, just given everybody else that we've got going on the day, but this is a horrible matchup. I want to probably stack the Angels if I can make it happen, right? 257 batting average allowed to the righties this year for Henry. 339 Woba. That's kind of elevated. Not necessarily because of a super high walk rate. It's just 8% to the right side. 200 ISO is a big number, though. 16.5% K rate to the righties. Also a very short figure. 28% hard and 17% soft. I'd wish that you know the soft were a little bit lower and the hard were far higher, of course. But he's a neutral ground ball to fly ball guy that pitches to a boatload of contact in the opposite side of the platoon here. Now, he does have slider curveball change that allows him to survive. So at that price tag, that's what really kind of would attract me to him. But overall, I just don't think there's any upside in this particular matchup. You know, you're going to need probably 25 somehow. I don't know who's going to score 25 in the mound. Um, but you're probably going to need it on a 12-game slate from your starting pitchers. And I'm not sure Tommy Henry has that in the tank all that regularly in this particular matchup. Um, and even the lefties you could play. He's given up a little bit of pop there, too. And they get a pretty good lefty for the Angels, right? Shohei is excellent. Um, but I really like Taylor Ward and Mike Trout here tonight. Trout less so because he's 6,300, but it's Trout. Um, I'm not jacked about Brandon Drury at 4,800 or Hunter Renfro at 47. They're kind of expensive there, so I'd probably prefer to get to like an Eddie Escobar. Really like this. Dual eligible hitting from the right side, 3,300 tonight. Or a Luis Renjifo, maybe if he's in there, he has good numbers against lefties as well. Chad Wallach, maybe even a David Fletcher. Um, price adjusted, those few guys are, are really strong plays, I think to mix in a Shohei and a Trout. You're not fading Shohei and you're not fading Trout in this particular matchup against Tommy Henry. Uh, so I, I like getting to the Angels if I can make it happen. It's price tags there. And I think playing some correlated stacks with Griffin Canning on the mound is okay too. 8,300, it's okay. It's not really all that bad. He's getting some ground balls as a matter of fact. And that's with the... With the curveball change, staying a lot more down in the strike zone than he has historically. He was mostly a four-seamer slider guy when he came up. And his the last couple of years, he's really just been like a two, three-pitch guy with a little bit of the change here. And it's given him a fly ball lean. Now, he's still kind of fly baller at uh, buck 20 to the right side with some hard contact. So you can attack that with the very good offense over here. And some good hitters from the right side or the left side uh, in the D-backs. Um, but I think 8,300 has to put Griffin Canning in play. There's really nobody else in the in this range that you're super thrilled about. Um, Bobby Hen or, you know, uh, Bobby Miller, rather. Not um, I was thinking of Tommy Henry. Like, Miller is 8,900, so I'm not jacked about the price tag necessarily. I think Griffin Canning at 83, he's probably the, the best price-adjusted arm in this range. Out of everybody else, even above 9K, I'm not super thrilled about. So I think that it has to put him in play here. And even though I really don't like going after the D-backs, you know, Griffin Canning's an average to above average arm. And I like the Arizona offense um, against you know average and below average right-handers in particular. 
But that said, you know, they still got some really damn good hitters over here that don't strike out. You got to keep an eye out for Corbin Carroll. He's got a tweaked shoulder or something. He should be fine. Um, but they may give him another day or so. Um, who knows? Coming into the, the All-Star break, they, they're going to need to make sure that he's fully healthy um, because he's one of the only reasons that this team is 14 games above 500 and leading the NOS. Um or right up there with the Dodgers, if you, whatever the records are. In any case, you can play these guys if you want to go after Griffin Cannon, because he still does have some warts and some hard contact issues, and he'll give up a little bit of pop, right? 175 X ISO is an attackable figure, 37% hard contact in aggregate. He'll give up some dingers, definitely, and a couple of these guys that can get the baseball in the air uh, are very much in play. Cattel Marte, Pavin Smith, sure. Christian Walker from the right side, he's 4,800, so it's not great, but uh, he has... He's been seeing the baseball really well, and that's where he's going to be able to excel and make a lot of hard contact against Canning tonight. So um, I think some off the really off-the-board Arizona stacks are in play. Not my favorite. Probably just one-off pieces, though, where they're really well-priced um, or where they just kind of fit positionally. Um, or Corbin Carroll. I mean, he's expensive, of course, but you know you can always play him. That's kind of where I stand on that game. Canning and the Angels, no Tommy Henry, and very little of the D-backs, I think. All right, White Sox, Angel, uh, excuse me, White Sox Athletics. Tanner Banks probably going to go for them tonight. 5000 He's not stretched out enough to really eat it at this price tag. Um, I think there's, honestly, there's probably more depth upside for uh, Alec Marsh against the Dodgers at his relative price tag, 4000 than there is for Tanner Banks at 5000 against the Athletics. Because he's a lefty. And he's got a 16% barrel rate. Now we got a short sample, you know, whatever. Um, you know, but 16% barrels is a, a high figure when you've seen 75 hitters, no matter how you slice it. This is Oakland, and they are kind of sticky still against left-handed pitching. 93 WRC plus, mostly from Mysterio Ruiz at the top of the lineup. He'll be back there because that's where they hit him against lefties. I mean, this guy has a very real chance to steal 100 bases this season. Uh, he's got north of 40 bags this year, and we're not even at the break yet. Um, it's very possible that he goes for the, the century mark. And against every lefty in baseball, you're going to want to play him while he's under 4,000. 3,800, that's fine. He's got he's got 20, 25-point upside if he can make contact um, because he could steal two and three bases here. It, two, definitely, against a lefty. Uh, he's, he's got a lot of upside in that re, in that respect. But some of these other right-handers are, are just super cheap. Ledmus Diaz, really hard to ignore up at the top of the lineup, who doesn't strike out, and he's 2,400 at shortstop. Um, overall, the numbers, of course, not impressive. They don't hit for a lot of power, but they're mega cheap here. Carlos Perez behind the plate is 2,600. You can get to him. He'll probably be in the four. Brent Rooker has been dreadful over the last two months, but he's 3,100, still has plenty of power, as does Shea Langoliers who is not all that great, but has a little bit of pop here or there. Um, Jonah Bride is a $2,000, you know, upside at the price sort of play third baseman. That's fine. Oakland Stack's not totally out of play here. I'm probably going to stay off of a lot of it. Um, there's plenty of other cheap teams I think you can get to when who are not Oakland and not playing in Oakland. Um so that's probably how I'm going to approach it. Just get to some Ruiz, Rooker, uh, Ledmus Diaz types, maybe a Carlos Perez behind the plate. Um, but a, a five stack here or there, I don't think is totally out of question. Because Sander Banks is only going to go about three innings here. It's going to be likely a bullpen game. And I, I probably want to go after a little bit of this barrel right here, even though Oakland doesn't barrel the baseball all that regularly. Now, this is the guy, Luis Medina, for the A's at 5,800. If you get down here, this is probably the only one that you could consider, I think. Not to say that you want to go out of your way to be playing a guy with some serious warts, 12% walk rate, and just a 21% strikeout rate as a 9% K minus walk rate. That is not good. 48% strike one with 27% chase. It's just that ain't it. He's got a 495 OX FIP nearly with a 685 ERA. So sure, you got two and three runs worth of regression coming to you. Uh, I mean, okay, but you, you still have a 50 X FIP, you know, and a buck 65 whip with a 12% walk rate, you know. You can't give up 37% hard contact to same-handed hitters and really 
expect me to get excited about regression coming to you in your suppression metrics. So I think he's very much playable uh, because of the price tag and the value score here because he gets the White Sox. However, I think the White Sox are playable too because this is, I mean, this is not good plate discipline, um, not a good plate discipline batted ball or batted ball profile from Medina over here. So we got to keep an eye out for what they want to do. They might play this opener shenanigan nonsense that they do often with him. Um, I think his upside is probably capped at about 15 to 20 points here in this particular matchup because he's going to walk a lot of guys. He's not going to strike out a lot. And even though the White Sox don't walk, they're really not going to strike out all that much more than average, right? Just 23% here in aggregate uh, against right-handers this year. Buck 35 ground ball to fly ball. You know, they're going to hit a lot of ground balls. Luis Medina is a, you know, a fly ball lean against the right side. He's got serious problems here. 291 to the right. He's 401 Woba with that 12% walk rate and a 316 ISO allowed with hard contact and fly balls. So he can still give up some line drive type of loud contact here against the White Sox tonight. So that's got to put some of their ground ball hitters in play. Notably, well, it's pretty much all of them outside of Luis Robert that are ground ball hitters. Tim Anderson, 39, still playable. Luis Robert is 47. He's definitely their best power hitter. Um, Eloy Jimenez, high ground ball hitter too, 4,100, very playable price tag. Those are got to be my favorites. I, I, I think Andrew Vaughn is okay as well at 3,200. Um, Andrew Benintendi is always going to pop because he's 3,000 and, he, and he leads off. But he doesn't really have a lot of upside necessarily, but you can play him in stacks. So I think both are in play. you got to side with the White Sox because this is an Oakland pitcher who has a ridiculous walk rate. And they get the Oakland bullpen too. Um, but if they open somebody and then bring in Luis Medina, like it, in that scenario, I think he's probably overpriced because he is likely only long for about four, maybe five innings. But if he is does come in as the true starter, I guess that puts him in play. But ugh, I'm really kind of lukewarm on this. Not super excited. I don't think I'm going to be able to get all the way down here on the mound tonight, nor do I need to. And if I do, I might just mega punt with like, in Alec Marsh or something and just not watch a game. Um, so that's kind of where I stand on this late game. Offense certainly in play. Probably very little pitching, if any, Luis Medina for me. I'm um, probably just not going to deal with it. Uh, all right, last game of the night here. Let's finally get to it. Been going kind of long. Uh, McClanahan on the mound at 11,000. He's the guy above 9,000 even that I'm super stoked about playing. Um, I want to go after Seattle for sure. His ownership is actually coming down. It's mostly because of the price tag here. Um, now, he is not the elite Shane McClanahan that he was last season. Right? He's always had a little bit of a reverse split in terms of the strikeout stuff. Right? He's got way better strikeout stuff against the right side than he does the left side. So this isn't necessarily just short sample noise that we're seeing with a 21% K rate to the lefties this year versus a 28% K rate to the righties. It's because he has an elite changeup and a well below average slider. He has a difficult time inducing whiffs there. So that's why you see a lowered strikeout number uh, to the right side. However, production-wise, to the righties, you know, even though he is a lefty, uh, they they just don't hit for anything. He gives up a little bit of hard contact and a neutral ground ball to fly ball, but a 191 batting average allowed with a 273 WOBA and just the 165 ISO. These are playable figures. Expected metrics: 232, 305 WOBA with a 155 ISO, X ISO. Um, Aggregate 27% K rate. This is all very attractive because Seattle is actually the second highest split adjusted strikeout team on the day to the Twins. 27% there, 241 batting average. So all of their righties, despite being right-handed heavy, that do hit left-handers a little bit better, are really going to struggle here tonight. And they're probably going to strike out a lot, including Julio. Teoscar, he makes a lot of barrel contact and... As I mentioned, this is not necessarily the same Shane McClanahan that we saw early last season when he damn near won the Cy Young. 9.5% walk rate with a 10% barrel rate and some hard contact. Now, we go after those numbers, right? 90% strand rate is very high. He's got a two and a quarter ERA with an XFIP a run and a half higher. We go after these numbers in general, but I do not want to do it with a super high strikeout team. And he's... Like I said, he's got an elite pitch here with the changeup, 28% strikeout rate to the right-hander. So um, 
average offense down here, and I don't really want to deal with that. I don't want to play any lefties uh, because was well, J.P. Crawford and what they're probably going to even start platooning Jared Kelnick since he's been really cold recently. Um, but these righties, Julio strikes out, Teoscar strikes out, Gino strikes out, Tom Murphy strikes out. You know, they'll probably have A.J. Pollock in there, maybe a Dylan Moore as well uh, as well as a Josie Caballero. So they're going to go right-handed heavy, but I still think there's plenty of strikeout upside for McClanahan. It's just at $11,000 price tag that you got to balance here. I'm okay eating 25% of my teams because as we talked about today, there's not a lot of guys that we're super thrilled about playing. A um, couple in the mid-range and McClanahan really up at the top. So I want to go after Seattle, and if he gets bludgeoned and, and blown apart um, you know, by the Mariners who are bad, then I guess I'm just going to get beat tonight. If I do have to play some some Seattle on the other side, uh, you, you can always play Julio. That's fine. Um, but it would probably be Tay Oscar in a in tournament settings only at 3,700. He makes a lot of barrel contact, so this is a good barrel spot for him at least. Um, Gino as well. He does hit lefties pretty well. Hits for a decent bit of average still and some power at 3,500. Price adjusted, that's an okay play. Uh, outside of that, I mean... Sure, Tom Murphy, 24, A.J. Pollock, 28. Like, they're cheap, but they should be cheap because this is a bad spot. So that's kind of where I stand on this. Maybe a leverage piece or a hedge piece here or there against McClanahan, but I'm very likely to just get a bunch of him because he's the highest projected arm on the day, and he's in one of the best spots. So, yeah, let's just do it. There's plenty of cheap offenses we can get to, so I'm not super uh, concerned um, about missing out on or not being able to get to McClanahan necessarily. Bryce Miller on the mound at 9,200. I'm not super thrilled about playing him, right? This is Tampa. I think he's probably overpriced here. He doesn't have enough strikeout stuff for me to get super thrilled here. Here, He's got 28% Ks to the right side, which is great, but he's only got 16% Ks to the left side so far in this 100-hitter sample. And they're going to platoon very heavily against him. And this is Tampa. I, I don't play pitchers against Tampa unless they've got outsized whiffs to both sides of the plate. And Bryce Miller just doesn't qualify. Uh, now, I do like the arm. I do really like the control. No walks here at just 5%. And he's got elite strike one. He gets ahead of hitters because he's got a pretty damn good fastball mix and an okay change up here so far. But he needs more breaking stuff. He needs to be able to induce swing and miss. And that will in increase the strikeout rate. It's just 10% here, which is not impressive. And that keeps the CSW down at 24%. So I'm not dealing with a 24% CSW guy against Tampa. It's just not happening for me. I, I'd rather just play John Gray at 93. Um, yeah, at similar ownership, really. You know, so very tough offense to get to get to get through. Rather, 125 WRC plus. This is actually still the highest number on the day. Um, 33% hard. That's not the highest because Texas, you know, holds that title. But even still, 195 ISO, 22% K rate, 9% walk rate. All of this is is very strong. 261 batting average with a 344 Wobo as a team. Really, really good numbers against a guy that's not necessarily going to strike them out a whole hell of a lot. Um, now, they're expensive, so I don't really want to stack them. Because 49 for Yandy, 58 for Wander Franco. It's is uh, kind of aggressive. 59 for Randy Rosarena is also really aggressive. Um, and the other guys, Josh Lowe, still 46. You know, Isak is 43. Not super thrilled there. Luke Rayleigh at 44. Kind of an expensive price tag for him a little bit. So I'm not super jacked about playing Tampa necessarily, which I guess would have to put Bryce Miller in play. But I'm, I'm questioning real upside here uh, in this matchup. He's going to have a difficult time against a platoon-heavy lineup eking back some of the points that he gives up if he were to give up two to three runs, which I think is probably pretty uh, likely here. So um, that's kind of where I stand here. Mostly just pitching, but, you know, mostly just McClanahan, a piece here or there where they're well-priced, but um, overall not interested too much in offense in this game. Uh, okay, I think we are done here. So let's quickly go, go over a review. Uh, Minnesota and Baltimore... I think Pablo's in play. He's expensive, though. No Dean Gramer for me. I'm going to try and play some of the Twins and then just, like, shut the laptop early uh, when they get shut out for seven innings against Dean freaking Kramer. Um, probably no Baltimore, I don't think, tonight against Pablo. I do respect him, but he's just... I have upside concerns at his particular price tag. He's in play, though. Uh, Milwaukee and Pittsburgh. 
Freddy Peralta, I'm probably just going to come in under. I think he's a little suspicious here. They do get Brian Reynolds back tonight, does Pittsburgh. Um, and I like playing Jackson Winsky. I don't know why, but I, I kind of do. I can't quit the guy. So I think Pittsburgh short stacks are in play. They did just see Freddie literally two weeks ago. So uh, I got to side with the offense in that scenario. And I think he's kind of fishy overpriced with some walk problems here. Uh, Beto is in play at 78. If you land on this, it gets a really bad offense over here in Milwaukee. Boston, Toronto, James Paxton, I think he's really in play in tournaments. Now, he gives up a lot of hard contact, and that's super worrisome against Toronto. But they don't hit for a lot of power against lefties even though they probably should. Um, Barrios on the mound for Toronto. I'm probably just going to leave him off. I think he's overpriced for this particular matchup. I've got upside concerns. I mean, he's in play, I suppose. But I really like getting to some short Boston stacks where they're well-priced, and they're pretty well-priced, to be quite honest. Jaron Duran, Rafi Devers in particular, Tristan Casas maybe as well, 2,800. I like the Giants here tonight, 74. Uh, 74. Um, I'm looking at SF, and my brain said 74 somehow. Um, I like the Giants, San Francisco, and a little bit of Alex Cobb maybe against the Mets. This is a pretty low upside offense, and I think Alex Cobb's arsenal plays into his hands and his strengths here a good bit against this offense. They're pretty poor. No cookie for me. Uh, I want to play the Giants. Full stacks are fully in play uh, for me tonight, and some pieces here or there against Alex Cobb, like a Frankie Lindor meh, or a um, Brandon Nimmo, Pete Alonso type. Uh, Miami and Atlanta, I like, I like my... Miami here a little bit. Atlanta, too, if you could make this happen against Brent Hoeing, he's going to give a pop to the righties. But, man, they are out of control expensive. Uh, Mike Soroka, I generally don't like going after him, but he, he does pitch to a lot of contact, and Miami's really seeing the baseball. This is a pretty damn good team over here that just got their best power hitter back from the left side. I think full stacks are certainly in play. Houston and Texas. Um, you know, Houston's got to be in play, I guess, because John Gray can be bad. When he's bad, he's really bad. But uh, I like John Gray here a little bit. And against a very righty-heavy lineup, he still doesn't give up a lot of production to right-handers, despite the really uh, terrible outing against Toronto a couple starts ago. Ronel Blanco, no thank you. I want to get to as much Texas as I can get to. They're more attainable than Atlanta, but uh, they're still expensive too. So where you can make it happen, I'm, I'm cool with it. Uh, and I'm going to try and squeeze in as much as I can, as I really always do. Dodgers, KC, same thing here. They're very expensive, and they get a double-A arm. So I'm probably just going to leave Alec Marsh on the shelf, even at 4,000. But he's stretched out enough, and you know he's got, uh, I believe, two-plus pitches in the fast. But he's got big swinging strike stuff. Um, that could play for four or five innings and just allow you to survive. But... Um, you know, deep tournament stuff only. No Kansas City. I'm going to play a good bit of Bobby Miller here tonight, I think. Um, Kansas City's offense is just awful. Detroit and Colorado, mostly just pieces here, but full stack's obviously in play, definitely against Austin Gomber. You can full stack against Lorenzen, too. Um, this is an upside spot, uh, an upside contact spot for Colorado. I think this is fine. I'll probably have a little bit, but mostly just pieces here, I think, for me. Not jacked about the Colorado price tags, to be quite honest. Really do like the Detroit the Detroit pricing, of course. Yankees, for sure, against uh, Matt Libertor here. Um, he just pitches to way too much contact against the right side. And same thing with St. Louis. If you can make the price tags happen, their their price tags are awful. Um, you know, outside of, like, Arenado and Jordan Walker types, uh, I think those guys are fine. But um, I don't want to play either pitcher here. No Libertor, no Severino. Uh, a lot of the Yankees, every single one of them is well-priced. Arizona and the Angels... Arizona probably kind of off here tonight a little bit. I think I'm probably going to land on some Griffin Cannon, which I'm kind of gulpy about. Um, but I think he's fine at 8300 Price adjusted. He's probably the most attractive in this range, I think, outside of Bobby Miller for me. And the Angels definitely against Tommy Henry. He pitches to way too much contact. Doesn't have any strikeout stuff. Some really well-priced uh, pieces for the Angels to allow you to get to Trout and Otani. White Sox, Oakland. White Sox, sure, but a really bad ballpark for them, and they're a bad offense, so yeah. Um, but good batted ball profile matchup against Medina gives up a lot to the right side, and um, is, a, is a fly baller there. So not so heavy, like some of the J.P. Sears or um, they, you know, some of these other starters from, from Oakland. That, that really make them very hard to stack against, like a James Caprillion, for example. He was the name I was searching for. Uh, you know, a little bit more on a line, which plays into line drives for the White Sox. And they've got some decent line drive hitters uh, over here from the right side. So that's okay. 
No, probably no Luis Medina. I got a feeling they're going to do the opener nonsense with him tonight. Uh, but maybe not, since White Sox are so right-handed heavy. Uh, I don't know. They're kind of analytically sharp, though, so they might not do Who knows what they're going to do? Um, so I might leave him on the shelf. But if you get down here, I mean, you can see, compared to, to everybody else, like, he's the only one that's popping in the in, in this, this low price range down here for any sort of value score. So he's the one if you land on that. Uh, Tampa and Seattle, Shane McClanahan... Uh, a good bit here, maybe a, a leverage piece here. I don't know, Tay Oscar or something, looking for, um, you know, a bomb or two, something like that. But outside of that, mostly just McClanahan for me. All right, we are done here. Um, once again, keep an eye out for projections updates. We'll push those all throughout the day. And good luck to everybody on this big Friday 12 gamer.